Hello, uh, my name is Chris Hedlund. I'm the School Director of Teaching and Learning at the University of Lincoln and a virtual reality researcher. I'm here with my uh, long-suffering colleague, uh, Ben Williams. Uh, ben, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, my name, is, uh, my name is Benjamin Williams. I'm a PhD student in the School of Computer Science in the University of Lincoln. Um, I, I do all kinds of VR research, especially uh, motion simulation, which is what we're going we're gonna to be talking about about that in a bit a bit at the end um but yeah i i also research virtual reality quite a lot and uh <clears throat> me and chris have collaborated on a number of different uh projects more than we care to uh, admit right <laughs> yeah quite a lot cool uh, Let's start talk. the future of virtual reality in video games um so where this has kind of come from so i have been in VR research and commercial VR development um, for a number of years since about 2015. Um, the the company I lead uh, was one of the first to to publish a commercial VR app on what was then the new platform, uh, the Gear VR, um, which came out a small amount of time before uh, the Oculus. And um, most of my research has looked into virtual reality, virtual reality in, um, in a clinical setting, in rehabilitation, in video games. And like Ben said, we, we've done quite a lot of research together. But Ben's research, and I'll let him introduce himself, has looked more at where virtual reality is going, I suppose, where um, well, at least what we think the future of virtual reality is, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, so that's one thing I'm quite interested in. Um, so I, I mentioned motion simulation, and you know, <clears throat> you know, this talk is on about it's about the future of virtual reality, and I think a big part of that is, is uh, the these kind of additional modes of feedback like uh, motion simulation. So we'll, we'll touch on that, and and um, yeah, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> well, let's get started. Okay, cool. Let's uh, let's get into it. So. To break down what we're going to do today or talk about today, um, so there's going to be a couple of parts of this. The first thing is, well, in order to talk about the future of VR, we have to understand the the past and present first. So we'll talk a bit about uh, the past, where virtual reality has come from. Uh, it's come quite far since you know its inception back in what was it like the early eighties? Is it Chris? Mm, yeah, late seventies. That you know the very kind of incipient research. Um, and, and, you know, we'll look at what virtual reality is today. And then what we'll do is we'll talk about some important factors in VR's future. So <clears throat> the advent of things like AI, the importance of tracking in VR and how that can have effects on presence. Uh, portability. Portability is actually quite a big thing in virtual reality. It can, it's one of these things that can, you know, make or break some kind of virtual reality experience. There's been loads of times, you know, I've been, in some kind of virtual reality experience and the fact that there's a, you know a wire behind your head or the the headset's quite heavy and it's i don't know it it, it tends to sweat up your face quite a lot and um, that has quite a big, big impact on you know firstly you know the the way you play games but also on the experience itself i mean that that's the, that's one big thing to remember about virtual reality is it you are trying to promote an experience and uh, we'll talk about this in a little while but the portability changes that experience significantly. I mean, it's it's one thing to be, you know, in in a in a non-pandemic world, kind of sat around at Christmas, and you know, you put your virtual reality headset on and go, you know, maybe go swim with some fishes, um, or or, or fly through space and go here, Grandma, try that. Um, <laughs> whereas, in if it's more of a tethered system, if it's less portable. Um, you you then have to kind of invite grandma up to your your virtual reality cave and and you know sit you know it, it's it's different it takes people out of what can be an inherently social experience um, and anybody who's ever seen anyone play virtual reality it is fun watching somebody swing around in mid space batting off space spiders or whatever um, and it, it is you you inherently change that experience by let's say taking it into a tethered environment. Um, the other thing is, virtuality has so many. Uh, virtuality games have so many applications beyond um, just sheer fun and, and play. You know, we've seen quite a lot of use of VR for stress reduction, anxiety relief. Um, and again, if if you are wanting to to go to your your virtual Zen garden, 
you need to be carrying it around with you. You need to have it there when you need it. It's not much use if, if you then have to go home, lock yourself into your um, virtuality cave, kind of abstract yourself from from a social surrounding. Um, that portability makes it a lot more useful as, as almost like a therapeutic device. Uh, yeah, that, it's, um, it's a good point. Like the, the nature of something being tethered or untethered can have you know, massive effects on the actual thing itself. And, 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 you know, as Chris says, virtuality w was born from this, uh, this out of uh, its purpose for training and stuff. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. Um, but as, as it's become more and more popular, we've seen it being used for entertainment. And there's some really, really interesting uh, ways people use virtuality to solve you know some problems like uh well the first is training but things you know like virtual reality exposure therapy all kinds of different ways we can use vr that was quite interesting the the, the last thing we're going to touch on though is <laughs> the topic of this talk so the future um, where where we think virtual reality is going and um one part of this um, is my particular research uh, interest i absolutely <laughs> love this stuff um it's, it's affordable peripherals so so a big one is motion simulation. Um, but yeah, that's that's what we're going to talk about today. So virtual reality is, as opposed to when it first started, it's now this kind of far-reaching technology. It's almost a household name. You know, if you say virtual reality, almost everybody knows what you're talking about. But say 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't, you know, exactly the case. P people didn't know what these devices were. Nowadays, you know, virtual is quite popular and everybody kind of knows what you're talking about. It was almost, um, I wouldn't say space age, but it was almost a thing of science fiction. Actually, quite a lot of science fiction uh, TV shows had virtual. I mean, Lawnmower Man is one of the classic ones I always talk about. We had um, old um, uh, TV shows, game shows that were based on really rudimentary VR systems. Um, if you if you went to a shop on the like um, Meadow Hall in Sheffield, um, when Meadow Hall first opened, it had a virtual reality station, which were these massive platforms with these essentially CRT monitors that got lowered onto your head. It was it's quite a, a significant tethered um, experience. I mean, even if we think about um, uh, a slightly more modern films, you know, I mean, Little Mo Man's quite old now, but The Matrix. Is essentially a story about people getting trapped in virtual reality. Mm. Yeah, and 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 you know, virtual reality has come a hell of a long way. You know, as contrasted by that example, you know, years ago we had these massive, huge devices. You know, <laughs> uh, it's funny it, in a couple of slides you'll you'll see what I mean because I talk about the past of, of, of VR. It's these, these huge, clunky devices that you strap to your head. I, I don't know how people carried these things on their head well we didn't look... i mean this is <laughs> I, I remember the very first vr kit i ever tried was essentially mounted it, it was a big crt monitor you know a big old essentially a television um <laughs> that was mounted on a on a robot arm you know it was a counterbalanced robot arm because that was the only way of supporting the weight <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah virtual reality has come a hell of a long way you know from, from essentially TVs on your head <laughs> to, to these uh, to devices like the one here on this slide, uh, which are quite portable and extremely powerful. Um, and VR was born, as I said, from practical uses. One of the, one of the first uses of VR was in surgery simulation. You know, as you can imagine, it's quite hard to practice surgery without having you know potentially dangerous consequences. So virtual reality was a really good way of practicing that it still is you know um but this is where vr started is, is in these practical uses and as, as we'll see virtual art has come a long way from what it was and now it's used in things like entertainment um and as a result vr as vr has progressed the research in this area has progressed as well so there's there's absolutely tons and tons of subtopics uh, about virtual reality things but you know, subtopics on how we perceive things in VR, um, how we can reduce, uh, you know, some side effects that come with VR, things like cyber sickness, um, exposure therapy, and all these kind of different applications of using VR um, for training purposes or, you know, in entertainment. Um, there's 
absolutely tons of subtopics in this field. So, so if you you know if you're interested in seeing those or fight fire up Google Scholar and just have a look have a look around mm. those papers. Yeah, I mean it's a popular talk again if you're looking at games development conferences, GB, uh, GDC. Um, virtuality is a, a topic right at the top of those discussions these days. So it, it it is a really interesting area, and it's so diverse. Yeah, definitely. And it's uh, I, I think one of the things about virtuality is that everybody kind of knows it as this emerging technology. You know, it's uh, it's it, it, it is becoming the future. You know, it's getting more and more normal to uh, like I said, you know, t- twenty thirty years ago this was unheard of, but now it's almost a household name. Um, and virtual reality, I, I don't want to say is the future because, you know, I, I, I'm not a, an oracle or anything. Um, but you can see how, you know, virtual reality is becoming more and more popular and more and more accessible as hardware is getting cheaper. Um, so, yeah, the next thing I'm going to talk about is about rethinking the rules. So virtual reality changes how we have to, well, with regarding to with regards to d- designing games, when we consider virtual reality games, we have to think about how we have to think about how we design games differently. Um, so, for example, in your standard desktop game without virtual reality, um, you you interact with the environment through I don't know a, a mouse and keyboard. Yeah. Um, but with with VR, um, you have the capability of actually touching and interacting with objects so we, so we have to we have it's, to... it's kind of a, a less and a more right because I, th- I think we i think when we, we play on a, a keyboard we often think oh if only i could just reach out and and do this task whatever that task is um and you know oh in virtual reality we think oh that would be easy i could just you know move my controller and pick up the object and but I think we also forget how much fidelity a keyboard gives us. You know, I mean, the amount of different keystroke combinations. Um, so, uh, many of your kind of modern AAA games, uh, I think things like Red Dead Redemption. You know, almost every key on the keyboard is is mapped to some action or some behavior. Now in VR, yes, we can we can pick something up and we can manipulate it with you know in in a much more natural way. Um, but we lose that fidelity of being able to type and be able to do things like that. But I mean, I think the big one here is, you know, the, we were very used to um, certain methods of moving around a scene. If I want to walk around an environment, that's easy. I, you know, WASD, arrow keys, I can walk around, I can interact with things, I can click on things. I, I'm used to being able to do that. Now, in virtuality, we know that if we allow people to just move in that way, that, that kind of sliding along the floor, um, a locomotion, people get very sick very, very quickly. So we need to think about new ways to move around a scene, move around a room. And the, the one I usually get when I talk about this at conferences, well, we're in VR. Why don't you just walk, you know, in physical space? But we don't have unlimited, you know, we might have unlimited space in the virtual world. But if I'm playing this game in my bedroom, you know, and I just keep walking forward, I'm not going to hit a wall. You know, so we have to think about ways of actually giving people the sense of motion while keeping them relatively fixed on the ground. And most games, we, we have this thing called room scale. You can move around a bit, you can walk around the environment, but within a bounding box. Because again, we have to avoid people walking into walls and, and kicking bedposts. Um, and this is forcing game designers to really rethink the rules. And, and actually, nothing. Nothing has changed the way that we have designed games so much since since the development of the very first video game. We've always had basically a similar control schema, even when we were using we you know uh, game pads were available and things like that. We still had some very familiar controls, very familiar ways of working. Virtuality has shattered the rules like no other technology ever. Um, so yeah, rethink the rules. Um, Moving on. Um, so after that, uh, I just want to talk about the the start of virtual reality, and you can see what I mean. I mean, this is one of the on the left. This is one of the first virtual reality headsets in the uh, sometime in the eighties. You can see how bulky these things were. You know that that looks pretty heavy. <laughs> um, but virtual and that reality, was a small one. 
That was a, generally <laughs> a, a really small one. This is actually, this is quite advanced, <laughs> you know. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other thing you can see there as well is you've got these kind of uh, actuated gloves um, for for haptic feedback and this kind of stuff. Um, and and virtual reality, you know, back then it was just this kind of emerging technology, and it you know it was outside the scope of. Um, consumer products so you couldn't go into a shop and and, and buy virtual it was limited really to certain academic institutions um specialist training research organizations so things like this on the left uh, the nasa ames research center so they were looking into how they could use this to train astronauts and, and, and stuff like that like you say expensive clunky and inaccessible you you had to <laughs> be nasa to afford this or Steven Spielberg. I mean, so if, if anyone has ever watched the first Jurassic Park film, um, let alone fact that you actually see these gloves in that film, there's a, there's a scene where they, they show them breaking down the genome and they're using a set of those actuated gloves um, to do that. And that, again, that's in the, the first Jurassic Park film, this exact kit. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Actually. That's quite cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, as Chris says, this this stuff was ridiculously expensive back in the day. And and because of that, you know, only specialist training and research organizations had had access to this kit. Um, and, and because of that, you know, the, the large majority of research and use of VR back then um, was just in simulation and training. So, so simulating uh, environments, I, I mean, simulation and training is still a big part of VR, but it, it, it's, it's so much more diverse than it was uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so here's just a, a, a quick example of how far it's come. So back in the 30s, we had uh, the advent of things like uh, flight simulation. So in the top left is a guy called Edwin Link. And all those things on the left are the Link, the first ever flight simulator called the Link Trainer. Um, and I, I talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, so I won't go into too much about that. But you know, from the first flight simulators to, you know, the 1980s where we had the f the first actual, you know, digital kind of VR headsets, you know, we had um, mounted, head mounted displays. And there's a couple of uh, examples here. So there's the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the quite um, interesting looking uh, VPL data suit, which is a, a kind of full, full body virtual reality suit. I'm, I'm, I'm I think it, did things like uh, try to give haptic feedback across the body, uh, and Chris Chris might know a bit more about that than me. Yeah, um, so th there's been <laughs> there's a lot of uh, discussion about the, these kind of um, suits. I mean, the, again, you can't think of anything kind of more inaccessible than something you actually have to climb into the whole thing, right? <laughs> um, and again, I, I talked about getting annoyed that we've got to take Grandma into our virtuality dungeon, you know. Um, just imagine if first we've got to get her kitted up in in your VR wetsuit. Um, <laughs> assuming you've got the right size for, you know, it it's, it's just makes it uh, clinking. Actually, those, those kind of old, the, the, the big style headsets I was talking about at um, arcade centers, you've actually got a picture of that in the, the top right in the slide. Mm. Um, there was one of those, uh, let's say, a meta hall in Sheffield in when it first opened in the very early 90s. Yeah, that that. That picture up there in the top right, that looks very uncomfortable. <laughs> it looks huge. It must be very heavy. Um, again, there, there was like there was TV shows. There was whole um, uh, game shows, I think, uh, if anyone remembers Nightmare. Uh, but there were whole game shows that people were wearing that kind of kit. And, and it was the future. Look, look it's virtual reality. <laughs> but, but this is why, you know, we, we sometimes say v VR is new. VR is not new. VR is quite old. But realistically we've seen it kind of come forward it came forward in the early 80s but it was really inaccessible you had to wear your vr wetsuit no one <laughs> wanted to do that um and and the technology the interest in the technology died off it just felt inaccessible and unusual they got this resurgence in the early 90s and again we saw a lot of things like game shows and and um a lot of uh sci-fi and and media interest but again, it was that big and it was heavy and it was uncomfortable. So interest died off. Um, and yeah, that, that took us to where we are now, I guess. Yeah. Um, so 
just to summarize this slide, basically in the 30s, we had things like the very first flight simulators, which gave way to this kind of interest in simulation. The 80s, we had very early tech, very expensive, clunky stuff. <laughs> and and you know the initial research and then as chris said there was this resurgence of vr in the 90s so so um vr headsets got smaller more comfortable and we saw more interesting uses for vr so so you know entertainment for example um you know fast forward to today and vr is very very different from what it used to be um i mean it's an established technology worldwide so everybody kind of knows what vr is and there's tons of different people um who develop vr headsets it's very, very popular in entertainment. Um, you could say, and I, I'm not sure if this is exactly true, but it, it is possibly the most popular in video games now, um, as opposed to training, um, at, at least in the in just entertainment use. It's virtual reality is affordable now. Um, it's still quite expensive. It does have, you know, it does have a. Are you going to say I mean, something, Chris? Yeah, it, yeah for, for me, I mean, it's one of those classic things about technology. You you know when they've become successful when you start seeing um interest in a broad range of applications right i mean the when it was you know almost purely medical or or engineering like say nasa and, and groups like that um that tends to be how things start and then when you start seeing them in in the hands of the user obviously it's you tends to be more entertainment based or education Entertainment and education is often where you see these kind of breakthrough technologies um, because, you know, we all like to be entertained and we all need to learn. You know, it's, it's almost a universal truth. Um, so we start to see a lot of that, but it's, it's everywhere. I mean, there's films being dedicated, uh, being directed purposely for virtual reality. I mean, um, you know, we, we, we say, you know, we look at um, things like the, the games charts and things, you see a lot of virtual reality. I mean, even the adult industry has taken a lot of interest in virtual reality. You know, it, it, it's, it's literally that broad, everything from medicine to adult entertainment. It's, um, it, it is a very broad cross section. Yeah. And the other thing we, we've seen, you know, is, is VR is now purchasable. It's much more lightweight. It's one of the, recent things uh, that's come out of vr is portability so you know pr previously we were tethered um but some headsets now actually have portability um and and, and um that obviously has changed the game as well and by far they're the most popular as well i mean um when so so again the company i i, I lead um we, we we see quite a lot of data and statistics and actually those portable headsets i mean the early one you you took your in fact i've got one on my shelf um you took your mobile phone and you slid it in you you kind of took the computer around with you and the the headset was almost just a case that you put your phone into now those um styles of headsets have been so popular um because they were so cheap they were so accessible like see you already had the hardware with you the the the, the, the headset was just a plastic case so it made that accessible to a huge amount of people. Um, more so, again, than being tethered to a system, which we're going to talk a bit, a bit about immersion, but this idea of when you put VR headset on, you want to feel like you're entering the matrix. You want to feel like you're entering a virtual world. And nothing kind of distracts from that than this big copper ponytail off the back of your head. <laughs> That's keeping you tied to the floor. <laughs> yeah, um, and... Uh, you know, I can I can attest to that. I mean, like I said earlier, th there's nothing more jarring when you're fully immersed in a virtual world and you're having a really good time, and, and tripping over your wires. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it is, you know, it, it is quite a big thing. And there's many practical applications now for virtual reality rather than just simulation and training. Um, and and we did mention this earlier. There's quite a lot of research out there with regards to VR. Um, so just on the research side, here's some examples of where it can be used. So entertainment, we've talked quite a lot about that. Video games, VR, that kind of stuff. Training is, well, the original purpose or, or, or the, one of the most original uh, uses of VR. So here's a here's a screenshot of them actually training um, modern astronauts with, with VR, just like they did back in the 70s and 80s. Um, 
And then another interesting field, which has only just come about recently, is this idea of immersive data visualization. So actually, instead of looking at a 2D chart or, or you know, just a, a 3D visualization of something, actually having the data um, in the real world um, is quite an interesting field of research. It's been one of the dreams of kind of data visualization, right? To have that whole minority report thing to be able to to grab a data set and go expand that and and zoom into it and using hand motion and and we're doing that in VR now. It's I think it's really cool. Yeah, I I mean so some of the coolest things that I've come I've seen come out of data visualization uh, data visualization is things like um, virtual reality infographics. So this this idea of you never get the idea of uh, the true scale of something until it's actually in the world there so so i, I remember i might be misremembering this there's uh, some virtual reality application where they plot where earth is and where the moon is and just seeing that distance between the earth and the mm. moon in in vr it it gets the point across that it's very very, very far away um so, so yeah, VR, VR data, visual, data visualization is a very interesting, uh, very interesting topic for VR. Um, the last one is exposure therapy. So exposure therapy is a is another interesting field in VR. Um, it, it's not my particular forte in 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 VR, um, but it's a really interesting idea. You know, can we um, introduce people to their fears in VR, where they, you know, you don't have to actually suffer the consequences of seeing that thing in, in, in real life. Um, can, can we, for example, eliminate the fear of heights by exposing people to, I, I don't know, like some kind of rope walk thing in VR where they don't actually have the danger of falling off the rope but still ha have to encounter their fear? Can, can we do that kind of, uh, that mm. kind of thing? Um, and that, that's, that's another very interesting topic uh, for VR. So we, we've talked about tethering and, and uh, sorry, tethered and untethered v, uh, virtual reality yeah. experiences. And... I think this is, this is one of the, the key areas at the moment, right? I mean, when, when we first kind of came around, there was almost a, a battle, which is going to be the successful one. And, and I think everyone was leaning towards tethered because they were so much more powerful and they still are a lot more computationally powerful. I mean, the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, the fact that you can have an umbilical going straight into your computer, as we put in here, it allowed you to unleash the power of your desktop or console, which was significant. You know, I mean, the the way the video games industry has moved um, from, let, let's say, back in the days of Mario to now, it's been higher quality graphics, uh, more complex AI, larger worlds, computation, 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 memory, memory, memory. Um. However, the, the computers required to run these things were really expensive. You know, after you spent, you know, seven hundred pounds to to a thousand pounds on your headset, you've then got probably a cost of about two two and a half thousand pounds for your for the computer to run it. Um, it keeps you tied to one spot, um, which, as we mentioned, can be really isolating. You know, it can take you out of that social situation. Um, you know, Christmas Day, opening your 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 new virtual reality headset, and and put you into an isolated environment. Um, Cable tripping. Um, <laughs> everybody who's tried a headset at some point was either wrapped themselves up in their own cable or tripped over it. Um, but one of the big advantages and one of the reasons why us as kind of developers were quite hopeful that this was going to be one of the winners um, was it was kind of easier to develop for. You didn't have to worry so much about um, optimization, all the skills that, you know, games as they are developed now are very different to games from 10 years ago. The amount of optimization we need to do and, and things like that is, is different. The way that we use graphics and shaders and lighting and all that is different. So all these kind of skills we built up, we could throw them at the tethered system. However, untethered has a lot of advantages for the user. It's portable. It's accessible. The, the untethered systems have tended to be a lot cheaper um, because it's, it's all in one, you know, and you, you don't have to worry about a second computer it's free of cables. So again, you don't have that. And these cables are quite heavy. You know, it's, it's a full wrapped data cable. And you don't have that dangling off the back of your head. Um, 
so it could be more immersive it can feel um like you you're embedding yourself more into that environment because you don't feel quite literally tied to the real world um however much lim- more limited computational power it, most of these are running what is essentially a mobile phone inside even the the all-in-one systems it's still basically a mobile phone architecture so you have limited computational power you have limited memory you have limited actual power and again the, the systems that were using a battery so using your your mobile phone it was, it was running off the mobile phone battery which wasn't designed to run high intensity vr games so you're burning through batteries fairly quickly some of the modern all of one systems are a little bit better at that but the one big thing that really I'm trying to avoid using explicit here um <laughs> really irked <laughs> us as developers <laughs> is that vr apps often didn't have priority on the mobile phone based systems so things like the the gear vr um so as you were playing your game something like your the updater for your calendar would take priority of, of a computational cycle so your your game would suddenly start lagging for no fault of your own the game wasn't doing anything wrong it was it was all should run well but because the calendar was updating, um, you lost a few uh, computation cycles and everything started to lag. It started to go slow. Um, you had thermal throttling. So, you know, as you probably experienced, if you played a game on your phone, it gets hot. Phones are designed to do things if they get hot because you don't want your phone exploding, especially when it's that far from your face. Um, so if it had got warm playing video games, it would throttle the computation, it would throttle the GPU. So suddenly everything would become slower again. So we had lots of challenges with that. And these are a lot harder to develop for. And we found ourselves as a developer going back into our kind of 1980s, 1990s book of tricks to find ways of squeezing a little bit more computation out of it. And and tiny savings in memory and, and processing were making huge differences. But... I think, again, we, the, the whole point of this talk is to make predictions of future. and We've largely strayed away from doing that. If I was to make one prediction for a future, tethered systems are going to die off. And I think we're going to see VR, virtual reality go heavily, heavily into untethered. And if we do see any kind of tethering to a desktop machine, it's probably going to be streamed. So um, wireless. Um, that is the way I think the sector will go. Would you agree, Ben? Yeah, I I think so as well. I think um, I, I as as we get more and more untethered uh, headsets, well, the the development of untethered headsets, that there's definitely they're definitely much more viable than they were, say, you know, five years ago or so. So so you know, developing for the Gear VR, one of the first untethered systems, it, it was you had crazy limitations on on what you could do. You know, as Chris said. Your app doesn't have priority, and and the processor isn't isn't built really for 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 games. You know, it doesn't have a separate GPU. It's it's an all in one yeah. GPU CPU chip. But now what we're seeing is things like the Oculus Quest and other untethered systems come out, which start to address these issues. So I I think I would agree. You know, we're moving away from the tethered kind of systems because untethered systems are getting much more powerful and and plus you know untethered systems are a, a hell of a lot better to to use you know you mm. can you can take an untethered system and and you know i don't know, go to the beach and, and fire up the your beach game or something um and and it's portable you can can use it anywhere um you don't have this wire that you can accidentally tangle yourself in <laughs> and um Next thing I want to talk about is that artificial intelligence is quite important in VR. Um, so people have this uh, sense of presence in VR, and it, as it says here, it can make them notice unnatural behavior a lot easier. So the idea here is if you're running a desktop game and the AI does something, it, it reacts to you quirky. in a certain way. Yeah, something, something quirky. Um, it, it, you won't notice it that much, but when you're situated in a you know in virtual reality because you're actually present in that in that virtual reality you notice things a hell of a lot more it's also why people are much more critical about um th- you know 3d graphics in vr so mm. a, a traditional you have guess- expectations right because you are if you're looking at something on a monitor you know that this isn't real so if the ai has this 
funny walk cycle um, as you're walking around. You don't expect the AI to react to you. Um, but as soon as you then put people into virtual reality, you you almost see it in a different way. You almost see those those AI as as other use other other people other agents that have you know agency and we expect if i wave at an ai i expect it to look at me and i expect it to wave back or do something else maybe you know swear at me and continue walking i I expect it to do something it has you often hear this called as perceptual volume it has presence in the space in the same way that we have presence in the space so again if we were to make a prediction for the future Artificial intelligence research in games, and we're actually seeing this is going to take is going to become more and more and more prevalent. We're seeing um, AI developers as having this this much stronger roles in game development companies now as well. And um, like we said here, the AI needs to respond to player. If we expect things in the environment to impact the player, we expect it to have um, uh, like an outcome that the, the AI to respond in a specific way. And as we said, all these important on a 2D monitor, we're not saying you can get away with janky AI in, in your desktop or your pl- uh, your console game. It is just very different to when, you, when you're playing a game, you're, you're almost taking the point of an observer. You're looking at this through this window into a virtual environment. When you're in VR, you're in the virtual environment and you have just a slightly higher sense of expectations. And if these things are broken, if these things don't work the way you expect, you're um, your sense of disbelief, your 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 immersion in that game can be broken really quickly. Yeah, and you know, as as I mentioned before, um, because because people are situated in this environment, you tend to be a hell of a lot more critical about everything. You know, <laughs> the, the graphics, the AI, um, and and as Chris said, a big part of VR in the future is focusing in on AI, and there's there's. I've seen recently that there's quite a lot of research going into AI and VR as as you know VR becomes more and more popular. The next thing is very similar, actually, very similar to what we talked about in the last slide. It's that tracking is very is you know becoming more and more important as well. We can gauge uh, you know a hell of a lot of motion from something you know the Pixar lamps, for example, by tracking body positions. You know, we, we we can get this reading of someone's behavior. And because we're in VR, we're, again, we're a lot more critical about that. Tracking headsets and controllers and so forth will allow, for example, um, in, in this case, you know, multiplayer experiences, actually tracking, focusing on tracking those devices and, and, and replaying that in the virtual environment is... Uh, will allow for these kind of very interesting multiplayer experiences. I mean, we've already seen it with things like VR chat and other multiplayer games, but actually using tracking there and how we can take the track headset and controllers. So actually tracking people's arm movements and then replaying those on some 3D model. Um, focusing on that is is quite an important thing. And it's becoming more and more important as we you know, VR was only limited to uh, single player experiences, but now we're seeing that VR, these multi- VR multiplayer uh, experiences come onto the scene. And because of that, the, you know, this tracking is very important and it will allow for these more kind of interesting, immersive uh, multiplayer experiences. Um, what, what do you think, Chris? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, multiplayer hasn't really been an area that we've we focused on in virtual reality up to this point. I mean, there, there have been some success. I like VR chat has been one of them. There have been some popular multiplayer games. But again, that kind of classic gaming experience of of sitting around a table with... I, 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 say I, I used to do this with my cousins. We would all sit and we would play um, some sort of fighting game or Mario Kart together. We haven't really seen that in virtual reality yet. That 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 together social experience because it can be quite dangerous. You've got essentially blindfolded people flailing their arms around. Um, one of my um, my favorite stories is if anybody ever remembers the Nintendo Wii um, that had motion controls, one of the most first successful motion controller platforms, and there was this game called Wii Boxing, and you you looked at a screen and you you box with a friend. Now I swung and end up smacking my friend who was stood very close to me 
uh, <laughs> on the back of the head and actually end up with a, with a proper knockout in that game. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't even blindfolded there, right? So there have been, there are dangers. And, and for that, one of that, huh, that's one of the reasons why we strayed away from that. But I think we can expect to see more of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's just a, a short video here. Um, this is kind of similar to what we were talking about, you know, replaying these tracked movements. So if I just play this, and I'm so let's just skip ahead to this bit. So it's a, it's a really cool game, actually. Um, but you can see that it's taking the hand track movements or the tracked hand movements from a player in the real world, and we're actually replaying that on some uh, virtual environment. But how, how we do that is is, is quite hard. Um, we have to use things like this, like inverse kinematics. And, and you know, this is just one example using uh, cubes and so forth. But it, it's interesting. It looks quite quite cool. I mean, <laughs> there's this people gun. You've got these two guns which fire out people. I, th I think this is really interesting because we were talking about um, um, player behavior and tracking, right? You can, If you look at this character here, this is actually a, um, a, a tracked player. Right now, the only information that we have is the orientation of their head and the position of their hands. But you can gauge quite a lot of emotion from this player just by how they're they're acting. Like you can kind of see a sense of wonder, a kind of sense of enjoyment, and and as they start playing the game and and they're running around going, "Oh, look at me!" You know, it's like this bit here that they you can you can see their curiosity and you can interpret so much just from their movement uh, do you want to move on then yeah sure uh oh there we go um so this next bit where i i start talking about um motion simulation before we can talk about motion simulation i just want to talk about a very big part of perception in vr because an, an interesting field of vr is is how we perceive experiences in vr and that's what i love focusing on in my research um it's this idea of multi-sensory integration. So multi-sensory integration is a very fancy word for something that's, I think everybody knows really. Um, and we use it everywhere in our daily lives. <laughs> and it kind of assumes this uh, non-conflicting relationship between all our different sensory modalities. And it's very closely related to um, our presence in VR. So, so a lot of people focus on this multi-sensory integration process to increase uh, presence in VR. So there's two things to note about this. This is, uh, before I get into that though, here's a, a in a nutshell, example of multi-sensory integration. It, it's, it's kind of what you'd expect, right? So he, here's three senses. We have uh, somatic feedback, air against the skin and change in temperature you know maybe you hear the whooshing sound of leaves and you see these trees swaying in in the breeze and from that you can predict that it's a it's quite a windy day <laughs> you know it, all it is really is it's like this idea of taking all kinds of different sensory modalities different senses taking information from those senses and making some kind of holistic uh, version of the world from that so in this case you know, if you've got air against your skin and a change in temperature, you've got the whooshing sound of leaves and, and you can see the trees moving, then you can kind of say that it's uh, you're perceiving a windy day. One thing to note about this is the more modalities we have, the more clear it becomes. So if you just have air against your skin and nothing else, um, if you if you just have this sensory information, maybe it's a fan, maybe it's a windy day. Or maybe you could be falling through the air. You know, if you just have access to that information, it's quite hard to uh, understand what's going on. The second thing is that um, you know, there's a fancy word there, cross-modal relationships. Um, so, what a cross-modal relationship is is how one sense relates to another. So, in this in this case, it says cross-modal relationships are important to perception, and it's true. You know, if 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 we have information that matches up with each other so if we have um you know for example uh this this example everything matches up we've got air against the skin which matches the whooshing sound of the leaves and we've got the sight of the trees it all it's all kind of congruent uh, but if we have this situation where we've got no sensation of movement we've got delayed audio feedback and we're moving through the sky very fast 
your brain is it will get confused um and the reason i'm talking about this is, is it's because it's very important in vr we have we come across these uh, things in vr because maybe we might have a delayed audio feedback maybe the headset runs a bit slow for for maybe two seconds maybe the tracking goes and these experiences that we're not used to in the real world can come out in vr you know if we have tracking errors or if we have delayed audio feedback which can happen in vr suddenly where where it takes you out of that experience quite quickly i mean i i know this, i know this from experience you can be immersed in, immersed in a virtual world and something like this can happen and that's it you're just uh you're just took took out of that world very quickly so it's very important to um our perception in vr and the, our presence in vr and there's some types of feedback that are currently being experimented with uh, with VR. So things like haptics, variable resistance gloves, which we talked about. Uh, Chris mentioned <laughs> Steven Spielberg and his his ones in Jurassic Park. <laughs> um, uh, we've got somatic feedback, so experimenting with uh, temperature and airflow in VR. So can we match up fans with your experience in VR? So if you're driving a car down a road and it's open top, can we match? Can we get some fans to blow in your face and, and give you that sensation of the wind whooshing? Vestibular feedback. Um, so, for example, motion simulation. Can we emulate actual movement of people uh, within the environment? And a very interesting one, which I, I only recently saw, was trying to emulate different smells in virtual reality. So, so can we give people uh, a sense of the environment through smell in VR? It's not one that we see a lot of because. Mm. It's actually surprisingly hard to make smells. Um, I mean, you can make smells, but actually controlling a smell, you mm. know. I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced a a smell that has lingered, right? <laughs> and and you want to be able to with with um, fragrance, with odor, to be able to turn it on, turn it off, um, and change it as maybe you move between rooms, uh, talking to different people, things like that. Um, but that is really hard because, again, this idea that smell lingers, you know, we don't have the same control over it. All the rest of them, we can control that via, we've, we've almost quite precise um, electronic means, whereas smell is, is, is a really complicated one. And people have been trying to crack the issue of smell for a long time. I mean, they're, they're all, you know, it's, again, it's it's in sci-fi the idea of the, the smell of vision you know things like that um it's it's a real challenge but there's some really interesting research happening in that area yeah and and i i invite you to go out to the scholar uh like google scholar and just have a look at these because there's some really interesting things these, these are just four examples there's, there's tons of other ways people are using um different types of feedback in vr the idea is is that you give people more uh, sensory feedback so maybe you have this vr kit with all of these things and you're more immersed in the virtual world as a result um, but this particular one vestibular motion simulation this is my area of research and um, so here <laughs> so motion simulation the, the usually the way we do it is through some kind of motion actuated chair so for example mm. this is the the chair we have at the university um and and it's what I do all my all my research on. So so using things like this game here on the left, Project Cars. Um, can we... saying, not just research. We also have a lot of fun on that chair. <laughs> yeah, We've played a lot lot of uh, racing games on that. Yeah, definitely uh, at lunchtime. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, uh, this is uh, this is what we this is what my research uh, looks into. Um, in particular, using this chair and and video games. Can we start to understand? how people uh, change the way they play games through motion simulation and also getting some idea of how they perceive uh, virtual reality games uh, with motion simulation. So the first question is, what is motion simulation? Well, that's an interesting question because th there's not much definitions on, on what motion simulation is. But we do know that motion simulators, or, or at least the way we can think of motion simulation is, it, the, motion simulators are just devices that like it says here, create the, the feeling of movement in a real motion environment, whether this is uh, through some kind of motion actuated chair or a platform, or, you know, maybe somebody actually, you're sat in a chair and they physically move it. Um, but usually what we do is we we hook this up to some kind of um, 
electronic platform that moves based on data we give it. And we usually do this through actuated motion, so have like hydraulic pistons and stuff moving this platform around. So yeah, for example, in this on the here on the left, I think there's a video on the next few slides. Uh, this chair actually tilts and moves as the player plays the game, and the motion matches, um, as it says here. You know, it's often synchronized with what they see. Um, otherwise, you, that might feel a bit strange. If they're driving a car and it moves forward, then you know the chair tilts back and so forth. Mm. So here's a, here's a an, an example. The best way to explain it is just to watch um, somebody have a go in it. So this is our chair, um, and this is our series Star and VR uh, projects. Um, well, I, I don't know if Chris wants to talk about that. Yeah, so Star and VR was um, a, a project we came up with as a way of um, exposing students to to different staff from around the university, so they could. You know, meet them, get to know a bit about them, and we we did this as kind of a a goofy race series, right? We um we ended up uh, interviewing people and then get them to do laps on our chair. And this this is Tommy George. This was um he was our student union education officer for a while. Um, well now works in the international office, but this is what the chair looks like. You know, it moves around fairly frantically, but the the motion of the chair is designed to um simulate the motion that you would feel driving so if you brake heavily the chair tilts forward if you accelerate hard the chair tilts back throwing you into the back of the seat as you would in a car um, as your car goes around a corner and the, the suspension rolls slightly you, you get that tilt um this is what it looks like it's it's um it's quite the experience yeah it, it, it's definitely um it's a very interesting experience if you if you haven't tried it before maybe try find find one um, and and have a go because it's 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 one of these things where i don't it's it's if you have a go in virtual reality and then suddenly you have a go in a motion simulation a uh, motion simulator and virtual reality um it it's a hell of a different experience um so moving on so when i talk about motion simulation there is another field of mo called motion simulation where it's about simulating the motion of real robots <laughs> we don't mean this we just mean uh, actuate motion of uh, these motion platforms. Well, there are some motion simulators that essentially put a chair on the end of a robot arm. Um, yeah, I, I've they're got, cool, I've, but they're very expensive. <laughs> very, very expensive, and I've got um, I've got an example of those uh, in the next few slides. So er early motion simulation started with the Link Trainer, which I talked about before, and it's rooted in flight simulation. You know, people were building these flight simulators, and they realized that actually an interesting part of that is the way the plane moves and how how people react to that. So the potential benefits to pilot training, and this was a very big part of the research um, in, in early flight simulation. One of the most notable examples of this is this Link Trainer. So on the bottom left, I'm sorry, bottom right, it's named as this guy called Edwin Link, and it uses these uh, suction pumps, uh, similar to like the, the bellows you use to uh, stoke a fire or so forth. And it uses these, these electrically electrically driven suction pumps to provide some very basic form of motion feedback. So this is possibly the earliest example of a motion simulator. Um, actually, I think there are ones that predate this, but this is the first one used in a training setting. Um, if you are interested and you are in Lincolnshire, um, the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre uh, has one of these. Um, I, I only realised this because I, I went to this place and I just found one <laughs> just randomly and I was like, Oh my god! Um, so if you if you want to if you're interested in that and you're interested in early motion simulation, go go have a look at it. It's quite an interesting thing. So we've come like VR. We've come a hell of a long way since the 1930s with motion simulation. In the 1930s, we just had the Link Trainer. Today we have this. Uh, this is an example. It's the MPI Cyber Motion Six Degree of Freedom uh, Motion Simulator, and it's it's different to, for example, our chair. Our chair kind of tilts and moves Just a on, bit. <laughs> yeah, on, on a on a fixed platform. This cyber motion is basically a very big, a very, very big uh, robot arm with a seat on the end of it. I mean, it's a philosophical thing, right? But at what point does motion simulation just become motion, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the, the amount that this is moving around, um, like I said, with the chair, it tilts you to, to give you the feeling of inertia and force and, and motion um but this is i mean this is actually moving you um i i 
it's it's something that me and Ben talk about quite a lot. Is at what point do these things become? Um, at what point have you stopped? Um, uh, simulating and started doing. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a really interesting thing because you know if you say what is motion simulation, you you know you can sum it up in a sentence or two, but the interesting area is where. The, the the kind of gap between motion and motion simulation is is blurred that's a really interesting area <laughs> for example virtual reality roller coasters is that motion simulation it, it's an interesting question so motion simulation today is still quite expensive like it was so i i, I mentioned this as you can imagine this thing on the right is very 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 expensive you know millions of pounds and so forth and motion simulation is still quite expensive but very recently, we've seen a, a reduction in price for motion simulators. I, I'm talking maybe five years ago, a motion simulator would set you back quite a lot. You know, you're talking tens of thousands of pounds here. Oh, five five years ago, I mean, probably fifty k. Yeah, a hell of a lot of money for it for a motion simulation. Certainly not one that we can play video games on, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but what we're seeing now, um, and this is why we're talking about this in the, in the in the future of VR talk, is that these very similar to the way VR headsets got cheaper and more accessible, motion simulators are starting to become much more cheaper and accessible, um, and they are starting to standardize as well. We saw this in VR as well. Is that most VR headsets weren't standardized; they had their own ways of doing things. But recently. As they become more standardized, it's much easier to develop headsets to a standard. It's the same in motion simulators. You know, everybody has their own bit of software to do something, but we are coming close to standardization and it's much cheaper than ever before. All mm. of these, if we if we look at how this happened in VR, if we look at um, all these things happened in VR and, and look how popular it is now, we're starting to see the same thing with motion simulators. So who knows, maybe, maybe in a few years, this might be some kind of, device you use to play games in your home maybe you can buy um an, an armchair with your three-piece suite that has <laughs> motion actuators built in so you can literally sit in your couch and, and get that sense of i mean and it's not that far from what is possible i mean we have um things like lazy boys where you've got huge amounts of of motion articulation in the chair it's just not powered we could yeah. power that and we could link that into our console um I think your next slide kind of um, brings us up quite well. Yeah, yeah. So so I, I've kind of covered all this. Another thing that's interesting is that people recently have started making their own DIY solutions to motion simulation. So it's quite a popular field. Um, here is a very good example of what I was talking about, it becoming more and much more accessible. Five years ago, as Chris said, it would cost you maybe 50 grand. It would set you back £50,000. That's quite a lot of money. Um, but here, we've got one of these in the university. It's a uh, your VR um, motion simulator. And it's much different to the standard kind of motion simulator you have where you have a fixed base and it tilts using actuators. The reason your VR is very cheap is because it uses uh, this, well, we call it the salad bowl because <laughs> it looks like a salad it's like, bowl. It's, it's like a salad spinner, isn't it? I mean, it, it <laughs> yeah. And and you, you do feel quite a lot like tossed salad by the end of it because of the, how it spins you around. <laughs> but yeah, the reason how this works is it's essentially just a, a kind of um, well, it's a hemisphere, so it, it's it's half a sphere. It's just a salad bowl, basically, and we drive the motion by tilting this uh, this this bowl using wheels. And because of that, it's very cheap. You know, if you if you want this kind of motion simulator, as it says here, I know one thousand four hundred ninety uh, dollars. I mean, still that's still less than the price of of a, a PC that you you, you know. So let's go back two years, the kind of PC that we were buying to power home-based commercial virtual reality hardware was two, two and a half grand. I think the challenge with this is, is its size. You've, you've got to, you know, and again, this goes back to your, your VR dungeon kind of thing. You've, you've got to have some dedicated space to place this. And it's, although it's quite compact, it's, it's still a sizable bit of kit. But let's say we do have one of these at the university. Um, we've got our own custom one. And we had hopes that we'd be bringing that, this out for people to play with at uh, at open days, but obviously, this you know, um, the the pandemic had other plans. So, 
Um, but yeah, hopefully, if you if you happen to be around um, in the future when when we're well, allowed to have people back on campus in the way that we used to, then come along, have a chat with me and Ben, have a play on the OVR. Yeah, definitely. It's it's. Uh, I would definitely invite you to just have a go it's it's a really interesting experience and it might you know it might well be something of the future you might actually be able to have a go on some bit of code which is uh you might find in the future but as we can see you know these things have dramatically decreased uh, decreased in price and as a result maybe you know if you saved up you, you could get one of these things you know it, it's 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 not exactly fifty thousand pounds you know um, and that's that's really interesting because this might pave the way for future devices like this so the future of motion simulation is like this. So simulators are moving towards home usage. The your VR has kind of pioneered that. And um, firmware and software is getting close to standardization. These are kind of all the, these are all the, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but these are all the hallmarks of um, something becoming uh, an emerging technology. And simulators are cheaper now than they ever have been mainly due to the fact that hardware um is is standardized and it's quite cheap to 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 produce and it's quite it's ready to hit the consumer market you know you might see this like i said in a, in a few years you might be able to get your own mo motion simulator and it might just be a commonplace thing you know most of the research regards large simulators so like the uh, mpi cyber motion the the kind of million pound <laughs> simulator and there's not much on recreational simulator usage but we are starting to see um, especially there's only a few papers regarding how we can use recreational simulator usage. And this is in particular what I look at. I look at everybody's focused on these big simulators and their use in tra training, but not many, not many people are looking at how motion simulator simulation is um, part of, it's going to be part of the future. And nobody's not looking at these uh, kind of smaller simulators and, and, and how they can be used for recreational usage. So the last thing I want to talk about is what the future will be. And this is, it's summarizing what we talked about, really. So, yeah. so I mean, it's, it's, I mean this is, for us, I mean, this is the prediction, right? That this is the bit that we're, we're trying to look into the future and say what it'll be. We've talked about tracking and the emotion. Uh, one of the things that is getting better, um, still not quite there, is environmental awareness. Um, so while you are blindfolded, you know, having alerts that when you're about to hit a wall or and being able to close closer track your body position so we can get better understanding of the pose and we can match that to the um the virtual player. Ben mentioned multiplayer VR. Um we haven't seen a lot of that. There have been some really good examples, but we haven't seen much. But again, we, we see this with with a lot of games. Um multiplayer tends to come slightly later and we think we'll see a lot more multiplayer VR. Um, Untethered, I think we're both in agreement with that, Ben, right? I think Untethered's yeah, the future, right? Definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, complex characters animation, AI is going to become increasingly important in virtual reality. And and I'll let Ben end because this is his area, the, uh, the affordable peripherals. Yeah, so I, I think a big part of VR in the future um, is the, these kind of affordable affordable peripherals? I, I've talked about motion simulation here, and I, I suppose I'm quite biased because it, it's the <laughs> it's the stuff I love. But there's there's other interesting peripherals out there. So, for example, the haptic gloves. Again, you know, they're becoming much more cheaper. So, all kinds of different um, ways of providing sensory feedback, and uh, are becoming much more affordable, and as a result, much more accessible. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think it's something that will be in the future of VR is looking just outside of the the headsets, um, not just the headset, but looking at how we can integrate other types of feedback. So things like haptic feedback, uh, somatic feedback, you know, airflow, this kind of stuff and motion simulation. Motion simulation is it might be a very big part of VR um, in the future. Um, so. So, yeah. So that's it for today. I mean, I hope hopefully it was a really good, a good talk and hopefully yeah you hopefully you enjoyed it brilliant well thanks ben and, and thanks for everyone for watching um let's say we, we'd encourage you to watch the next talk on the series which we've slightly overrun uh which is mark hanhide talking about um robots in the wild which will be really interesting and a link for that can be found in the comments so um well it's goodbye from me and uh goodbye from ben 
and uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. <laughs>